Hey, Lifescape community. Happy October. Hard to believe it, even though it's over 100 degrees still for till the end of next week. Um, we're going with fall colors now because it is officially fall. And Lifescape is celebrating its 17th um, anniversary or its birthday. So happy birthday to Lifescape. Um, Want to also just give a shout out to everybody who has honored us with their health over 17 years, um, to Drs. Posen and Stroman, who have been with me from the very get-go, uh, bringing this stream to life, to my husband, uh, Bob Wilder, who is um, just my perfect partner. And um, between us, we are very, very complimentary in our skills. I always say, um, I am the forest person. He is the veins on the leaves of the trees. Um, and together we just make um, this whole place work. And uh, Bill and Lori, now Dr. McMillan and Valerie, um, Frank and Eden, who just celebrated their 11th anniversary working with Lifescape, um, Alicia, who's been here three years, Dana's been here how long now? Two. Two years, oh my gosh. And we just have such an incredible team. We're really, um, really counting our, our good fortunes. Um, and here we are in 17 years later in the midst of a global pandemic. And um, so I'm gonna start today with just a little bit of um, a COVID update. Of course, the big news is um, that the president and the first lady have tested positive for COVID and um, you know, we hope that they do well. Um, sadly, I think anybody in healthcare is, thinks this was just um, not a big surprise. It was a matter of time. Um, you know, understand that the strategy of frequent testing being used by the White House as their only protection um, within their business and within their um, outreach um, is a reasonable strategy. We saw it work really, really well with the universities here locally when uh, U of A and ASU had some uh, pretty big outbreaks, frequent testing, uh, aggressive isolation quarantine. Now, isolation, when you test positive, you need to be isolated a minimum of 10 days, and that's isolation from other people in your home, from anyone who could be at risk of this virus. That actually helped suppress what could have been a huge community outbreak. Um, remember that PCR or rapid antigen tests that, that uh, we do for COVID, one, they have lots of false, pos false negatives, not a lot of false positives, but lots of false negatives. So they're not perfect tests, um, they're, they're reasonable, and they're not gonna be positive for at least the first three days of infection. So people who are infected can be infecting others for at least a day before symptoms onset um, or three days into um, the, the point of which their testing may turn positive. So, um, you know, I'm hopeful that they will follow public health guidelines in aggressive contact tracing, uh, quarantining of anyone else who may have been exposed because uh, with exponential growth, one case can turn into uh, dozens of cases and many deaths in a matter of weeks, um, if not properly contained. And, um, you know, I just have to say, regardless of your political leanings, you know, this is not a political issue. This is not an American issue. This is a global infection pandemic. So let's be clear. This is about common sense, not politics. So ignoring the guidance of public health experts, condemning masks and shaming people for wearing them, attending, much less promoting, crowded, packed, uh, um, events, lying and downplaying the severity of this illness um, of the global pandemic that has now killed nearly as many Americans as we lost in the entire Vietnam War. Um, and by the end of the year, we'll match the number we've lost in World War II and be tenfold the number of Americans lost on 9-11. Um, Doing these things is not just irresponsible. Um, it is a flagrant betrayal of the public trust. And I hope everyone understands it. I think our patients are smart. They use common sense. 
and um, they know that you know this is this is a situation we you know in our own office I I you know a staff meeting because I was concerned that you know what we all get tired of this and we all want to just go out to dinner and we all want to get back to our normal lives you know you know I hear over and over again I'm so over this and I'd say love to be over it but we're not you know we're not there yet so I said how many of us in this room have a COVID risk factor? You know, age, obesity or overweight, blood sugar issues, hypertension, immune, um, immune suppressing medications, asthma. 80% of us raised our hands. So then I said, keep your hand up. And now I'm gonna ask you how many of you have close contact with someone who has one of those issues? a hundred percent of the hands were up so unless you're living in a completely clear bubble we have a lot of people at risk in our close in our close proximity and it's not rocket science it's really really simple the one most patriotic thing that we can do is wear a mask maintain intelligent social distancing and listen to experts because, you know, that's what's gonna keep us from having, you know, half a million dead within a year versus a couple hundred thousand. You know, it truly is life-saving and every one of those lives is worth it. None of those people are expendable. Um, so today I'm gonna to focus a little bit differently on sleep because um, I truly believe um, one of my favorite TED Talks is by Dr. Matt Walker, who's the head of uh, the Berkeley Sleep Lab, and it's called uh, Sleep is Your Superpower. Great TED Talk, um, and it, it truly is a superpower. When I really look at the root causes of a lot of chronic disease, um, sleep is right there, whether it's um, attention deficit disorder, behavioral disorders in children, uh, which we lived with, <laughs> we've lived through some of those, um, uh, the diabetes epidemic, obesity and diabetes, metabolism is very much tightly controlled by how much sleep you get. Um, hormonal problems, low T is not a drug deficiency, it's a symptom. And one of the root causes of that symptom is insufficient sleep or sleep that's impaired by something like sleep apnea. Um, or alcohol um, is a common common underlying cause of that. And to me, to throw a drug at something when you haven't fixed the underlying cause, um, in fact, Dr. McMillan and I were just sitting in a, a continuing medical education course, um, update on atrial fibrillation, and the entire focus is on which treatment we deploy. Should we deploy ablation? Should we deploy medical management? Not once in any of the studies that they're listing or in any of the presentation they're providing do they talk about what are the root causes of atrial fibrillation, which one of the biggest ones is sleep apnea, alcohol excess, obesity. These are all tied together. So, um, you know, um, we, we need to look at, well, you know, what's happening with our sleep? You know, in the last generation, we've carved an average of an hour of sleep off. Well, you wonder why things like depression, anxiety, chronic fatigue, uh, mood disorders, focus, attention, uh, memory problems are becoming more and more and more prevalent because sleep is when our brain recharges its batteries, clears out toxins, stores memories, and um, allows us to recover um, hormonally, uh, nutritionally, etc. So super, super critical that we get enough sleep. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, on top of, I mean, again, from 2014 to 2018, Americans uh, experienced a decline in life expectancy, the only developed nation on the planet suffering a three-year decline in life expectancy, which is um, 
terrifying and largely due to what we call deaths of despair, suicide, overdose, alcohol re related um, deaths. So, um, and now add in a global pandemic where we have 20% of the world's mortality with only 4.6% of the world's population, um, along with political and social upheaval. Um, this is really a perfect storm. And I will personally say this has been one of my biggest health challenges is how to get uh, sufficient sleep. Um, many of you will see me wearing something called the Aura Ring, um, O-U-R-A, so AuraRing.com. Aura is one of many sleep trackers out there that um, people have Fitbits, Apple Watches, a, a number of different ways to actually look at the the amount of sleep you're getting, the phases of sleep that you're getting. So are you getting 90 minutes of REM sleep, 90 minutes of deep sleep? Um, in one of Matt Walker's studies, um, from every age, they studied 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, etc., cetera, um, doing lumbar punctures the day before and the day after, just selectively disrupting REM sleep. So they'd wake the participants and cancel out their REM sleep. The following day, at every age, they identified the, the proteins of Alzheimer's. Mm. Those are repair proteins. So again, all the drug trials for Alzheimer's targeting, clearing those proteins or blocking those proteins have, have largely failed, um, or really completely failed um, to do anything more than maybe slow the, the progression. But those are repair proteins. So again, what's the root cause of that problem? It's, it's sleep disruption as one of many, one of many root, root causes. Um, sleep um, deficit is also associated with severe immune dysfunction, a 70% drop in natural killer cells. So that means infection risk, including things like COVID, um, cancer risks um, go up significantly. We talked about the hormone dysfunction. Again, hormone dysfunction is a symptom. So we really want to understand what are the roots. I had, I had premature ovarian failure uh, working at the Mayo Clinic in my, in my 30s. Um, what was the treatment recommended? Well, you know, I could have IVF with a donor egg. That was the recommendation. And go on these hormones. Nobody looked at how... Um, you know, at why <laughs> my hormones, why my estrogen was 14 at 30 some years old. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it had something to do with the 80 hour work week and having a kid at home who didn't sleep through the night till the age of four and a half um, or, um, or all kinds of other uh, disruptions, maybe a little too much alcohol, a diet Coke habit, which was not healthy, uh, maybe too much caffeine and I have a genetic issue with clearing that, etc. But what the sleep um, trackers help you do is biohack, okay? That term was created by um, Dave Asprey, the founder of Bulletproof Coffee. And biohacking means, let me look at what's happening with my body and let me try some different things and see if I can help that. Um, working with somebody, obviously, hopefully knowledgeable, so you're not doing things that might be potentially risky. So, um, so I found wearing this that number one, if I eat too close to bedtime, which because I often don't get out of the office till after seven, that often is the case, um, I will have much more disruptive sleep. If I have any alcohol within three hours of bedtime, it will disrupt my um, sleep pattern. Um, I, if I miss a day of my daily calm meditation, my sleep is not as, um, as deep. I don't have as much deep sleep. Um, so, you know, a, a number of different things that have helped me tweak um, how best to help my own sleep. Um, some of the things I experienced be, being in many, many years of sleep def deficit were um, what many patients describe, brain fog, uh, a mild, low-level depression dysthymia we call it 
you know, just not motivated, very irritable. My husband could definitely tell you that, um, you know, he, he, he actually educated the kids very well. You do not wake mommy up if you have a problem at night, wake daddy up. Um, <laughs> because I was not a nice person the next day. Um, but also things like accident and injury risk go way up when your sleep is impaired. We also know inflammation um, is tied to poor sleep. Um, you know, we've talked about um, obesity contribution. Um, one of our, you know, first clues when people have, uh, that people may have impaired sleep is a high fasting glucose. So why, why would that be? Well, a high fasting glucose, and maybe their A1C long-term glucose is fine, mm -hmm. but a high fasting glucose tells you there is possibly a stress cortisol issue happening overnight. Well, if you have sleep apnea, and you are not breathing adequately um, overnight or you're, you're um, uh, breathing at a low level so your oxygen levels fall off, well, your body does two emergency um, actions. One is to release adrenaline, which, guess what? It makes you wake up and need to pee. And two, because you know, what happens when you know that fight, flight, fright, you, you have to release your bladder because you got to you know, run away from the saber-toothed tiger. Um, and it releases cortisol, our stress hormone, to get that blood sugar going to, a, to address the stress. What does the cortisol do? Well, fasting blood sugar goes up and you store sugar right on the spare tire. So one of the reasons a lot of us develop a spare tire as we get older, it's because our sleep is disrupted. Um, let me see. Uh, one of the things I just really am um, cautious about because I had been habituated to uh, Ambien for a period of time. Um, it, it, gosh, when I first started LifeScape, I had just lost a sister to cancer at age of 42. Uh, I had twins. I had, uh, you know, very three very young children. We had a building deal that w fell through in the midst of things. I told all my patients I was going to be in an RV on the Walmart parking lot. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> and we lost our very first golden retriever who was, you know, our, our perfect child. So, um, so a tremendous amount of, of stress, but boy, that drug is very habituating. It is not addictive in the standard sense. So you don't get, um, where you need more and more and more to get the benefit. And when you look at the clinical trials of it, the benefit is fairly minimal. People tend to fall asleep about 30 minutes or about 15 minutes sooner, and they tend to sleep about 30 minutes longer. So does that seem like worth taking a pill every day that if you take more than 18 a year, you have an increased mortality risk equivalent to smoking? That's increased all-cause mortality, cancer mortality. So, you know, when, when those studies came out in 2012 about the increased risk of any sleep medication, uh, Ambien, Lunesta, uh, the benzodiazepines uh, like lorazepam, diazepam, etc., cetera, uh, over-the-counter diphenhydramine, Benadryl, Tylenol PM, Advil PM, etc. Anyone taking 18 pills a year had a significantly heightened mortality. Well, why is that? Again, nobody's really done the studies to tell us that, but one of the things I recommend to any patient who's stuck on these sleep meds and feels that they cannot live without them is we need to do a sleep study because one of the reasons you may be waking in the middle of the night is that you're not breathing adequately. And I cannot, in good conscience, as a good physician, give you a sedative. It'd be like putting the pillow over a head of somebody who's already suffocating, right? So, um, and a, virtually 100% of those people who who are needing long-term sleep medicines have some form of sleep dysfunction. So sleep is important. We need to, you know, minimize our caffeine, kind of stick to a regular schedule of set a good wake time and set an eight hour prior sleep time, kind of schedule a wind down ritual um, where you unplug from your 
media. As I told my husband, no doom scrolling right before bed. You can get sucked down that rabbit hole and it will not make for a good night. Um, minimize alcohol. Alcohol is just not a brain food and it's certainly not, it, it's a hormone toxin, it's a carcinogen, and certainly none within three hours of bedtime. Um, and keep your room cool. You can try, um, uh, we have a Uller pad that uh, kind of chills the bed down to, to 65 degrees because our house is like 84. <laughs> it's not nice in menopause, just saying. But, um, but the Uller is very nice. <laughs> um, yeah, aim for complete darkness, even a nightlight in a room, even a tiny little green light on a phone or a piece of electronics can disrupt melatonin levels. And then um, ideally keep your electronics out of your bedroom um, if you can. So um, I'm gonna open this up for any questions that may have come through. The first one is, I get enough sleep about eight hours a night, but still feel tired in the day. Why is this? So yes, if you are, if your sleep is unrefreshing, not restorative, if you wake up feeling groggy despite uh, eight, nine, 10 hours even, sometimes I hear, um, again, you need a sleep study. That is a sign that something is wrong with the quality of your sleep. You could start out just with a sleep tracker um, and see see what's happening. Are you getting REM sleep? Are you getting deep sleep? Are you missing something? But um, I think seeing a sleep specialist is really critical in that instance. I wake up at night and often can't get back to sleep. What should I do? I think a lot of us have, have that issue. So, um, I, I, I've certainly had that many, many times. And my poor husband deals with me getting a book and saying, turning on my little book light and, <laughs> and annoying the heck out of him, unfortunately. Um, um, yeah, you can, you can do a number of different things. One is if it's happening often, you, you might, again, consider looking at a sleep study because that, that wake up, if you if you got enough, if it's adrenaline driving that wake up, it will be hard to fall back asleep. If it's just to get up to, to pee and you can pretty much relax back down, um, that's not an issue. I do love, um, things like the Calm app. There are sleep stories on the Calm app that are helpful. Delta Wave music. There's a lot of music um, things on YouTube and on some of these apps that can help people get back into sleep. I'll do some meditative um, uh, mantras, things like that. Um, and sometimes um, if it's just the brain racing, like you've got a lot of stuff on your mind, do a brain dump. I will get up, write my little list of all the things that are kind of fretting me and put it away. And then that allows you to get back to sleep. Um, I'll also touch on cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, this is really, really necessary um, that, um, you know, it is the number one treatment for chronic insomnia. It is the most effective way to treat chronic insomnia. So we really encourage, they're, they're working with uh, Dr. Lisa Stroman. There are online programs. Uh, there are increasingly sort of self programs. I, I don't have enough success stories to tell you one over the other, but um, I would really, really encourage that. I take melatonin every night to help me get to sleep. Is this safe or are there long-term consequences? You know, um, you know, we're always nervous about any medication, right? And hormones in particular, because, you know, melatonin is a hormone and our body, mm -hmm. you know, throwing in exogenous hormones, what is that doing to our endogenous ability to produce hormones? Um, on the other hand, melatonin also has some immune benefits. So we are recommending it right now because of COVID risk for a lot of people. Um, it has um, acid reflux um, um, support benefits by helping gut motility. Um, so there are a lot of benefits to it. I think a lot depends on working with your provider on what are your risks and benefits? Are you having any adverse effects? Some people experience dizziness, hangover fatigue, nausea, any, any adverse effects. Um, or medications that it could con conflict with, um, that needs to be worked out with your provider. Anything? Yeah, there's one more. Um, with the later morning and earlier evening, I find I need more sleep. Does that sound unusual or expected? Wait, with the later morning and, and earlier evening. 
later morning and earlier evening. Um, not sure what that's. I'm not. I'm not sure. I understand that question. So you may need a little bit more clarification. Yeah. Maybe if you wake, wake up later, and go to bed earlier, you feel like you need more sleep. You know, if we don't go to sleep by 10 p.m., there is generally a second wind of uh, of again adrenaline that happens. So you know, setting a bedtime kind of you know, and a lot of people have sleep phase disorders. Uh, things like that that really need to be worked with us or a sleep specialist um, to try to to correct or they will work on weird shift schedules which are really toxic to your health unfortunately um, but yeah sometimes um, and that's why you know one of the things that's just commonly recommended is sticking to as fixed a schedule as possible a fixed wake-up time and ideally get outside, get 10 minutes of natural sunlight in the morning. If I do not get out and do that walk, I do my little calm meditation walk, uh, a bunch of my patients see me walking around the neighborhood, um, um, my day will not go right, my sleep the next night will be <laughs> impaired. So that, that natural sunlight kind of resets your circadian rhythm and then really try to set a regular uh, bedtime as much as possible. Um, you know, uh, about eight hours before that, um, that, that wake time. Um, there are also changes in, you know, season where people, you know, we have, um, we're getting where it's getting darker much. That's what she meant. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's getting darker much, um, earlier and, and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, honestly, if we, if we lived naturally, we'd kind of follow nature's rhythms and we'd probably go to bed a little bit earlier and we'd sleep, we'd sleep a little bit longer. We'd hibernate more in, in the winter time. <laughs> so <Yes. laughs> natural, uh, our artificial lights are, are really not our friend. And, um, but you know, you, you got to live in the real world too, to a certain extent. So what do you think about watching TV in bed and falling asleep to the TV if it's set on a timer, is that okay? So the problem with with uh, watching TV or an electronic device, an iPad or something like that, is um, that it act, it's actually activating um, to your brain waves. And um, so that's really not ideal for sleep. For sleep, you wanna maybe read a book um, but not with an artificial light or using the you know blue blocker uh, night what do they call it night mode on the phone or mm -hmm. or device um, or wearing blue blocking lenses maybe maybe helpful but um, but yeah ideally you know one of the things I learned from having a child that took four and a half years to to sleep was um, we need to learn how to self soothe mm -hmm. um, and that is um, and that just takes take some practice anything else I think we pretty much covered it well again stay smart stay safe um, let us know if you have any other questions and um, thank you for being here with us take care